Hello, and welcome to our latest virtual bridge session. And I am joined by the mysterious. I feel mysterious because it's Hannah H. And now, now I'm not even convinced that your name really is Hannah H. It's, it's, You'll never know. I know, I know, I know. And it's, um, although, although we are talking to you in this room here, in this quiet, secluded room, um, for those of us joining on YouTube, you will be seeing a silhouette. <laughs> and, and and the real thing is so much better. I, I, I can say that. So you know, if you have time, <laughs> if you have time, join us for a live session next time. So Hannah H from the NCSE, um, you are going to help us keep ourselves slightly more cyber resilient. We hope with some advice. So without further ado, over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, everyone. I am now going to. One of the real disadvantages working for NCSC is every time you make a slight mistake with IT, you feel particularly stupid. So, you know, I've now got this, this you know, slightly nervous point where you try to share your screen and hope it works. That's it. Brilliant. OK. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to, nice to, well, I was going to say see you, but nice to be chatting to you. Um, what I'm going to do today is just, yeah, briefly explain a little bit about who National Cyber Security Centre is or what we are, myself, what we're doing, and then I'm going to rattle through some of the products and services, some of the things we're doing that you may or may not already be aware of. Um, so I'm afraid it is lots of PowerPoint slides, but, you know, there is a reason for that because most of them have got hyperlinks. So when I send them later, you can just go straight to the pages I'm talking about. So this is just to keep me on track, really. Um, and I'm certainly going to be interested to hear from you afterwards. What of these you yeah, are using, aren't using, might use, don't find useful, can't imagine finding useful, or what you think is missing, the whole sort of gambit, really. Um, so that's the general plan. So. I am going to, I'm working on the assumption that most of you know something about National Cyber Security Centre, not least because you are here, but just in case, and for anyone who's uh, watching the recording afterwards. Um, so we are part of GCHQ, hence the shadowy figure. Um, <laughs> and we're actually sort of, we were set up um, in 2015 to make the UK 2016, I'm sorry. Um, and our sort of tagline is helping to make the UK the safest place to live and work online. So we're part of the UK government. Um, we were formed by bringing various parts of various government departments and agencies together. And we're not a regulator, um, but we really are the sort of the technical experts basically on cybersecurity. So we've got quite a broad remit about what we do as an organization. Um, but largely, it was about recognising that cyber security is such a major concern for everyone as we live an increasingly digitalised life and for the security and prosperity of the country. It's something we need to be helping people with, individuals and organisations. So, yeah, there are many aspects to what we do. There's about a thousand of us now within NCSE. Um, some of us most of us are actually well were before a year ago, a year ago based um, at GCHQ in Cheltenham and about a third of us are or were based in our sort of flagship offices in London Victoria and that's the uh, very uh, postmodern looking um, red building there so that's broadly what we do um, and a sort of key part of it has been that we're not about just sort of telling people what to do. We really are about trying to understand how different parts of the economy and the different parts of society are working, what their needs are, and trying to make sure that we're distilling advice and guidance that's practical and actually useful. So it's, you know, not a, it's a, it's absolutely not sort of putting down regulations and mandating things. It's trying to get this whole balance between security and usability right. So that's NCSE. And as promised, here is my shadowy uh, picture. So um, my name really is Hannah, but you can you know, choose to disbelieve that if you like, that's fine. Um, but um, so we don't use our surnames because of the link with GCHQ. And that's also why we don't appear on video recordings. Um, so sort of slightly confusing, but basically because we're part of the intelligence community, we, have that, we need to have that level of protection about our identity. So I work um, within the education and academia 
engagement team. And there's about six of us, and we're responsible for working with colleges, with universities, with schools, with preschools, um, and advising them on institutional cybersecurity. Now, this sometimes gets confusing. I think a lot of people often think that there's a link between online safety, particularly of pupils in schools. Um, but no, we're very much about institutional cybersecurity. And so we work with lots of umbrella bodies, such as JISC, and Jason's here today, Association of Colleges, and, and so on. And personally, I lead on our work with colleges. Um, and in my, in my own life, uh, I am a school governor, which sort of gives quite an interesting uh, different insight, I think, sometimes to <laughs> what I'm trying to do in my working life. And as, I've, as I as I will, you know, said before, as a school governor, I can assure you that cyber security has never once been an agenda item on a governing body meeting, despite the fact that everyone there knows what I do and where I work. So I'm not kidding myself that um, any educational institution uh, necessarily thinks of cyber security as their number one priority. I'm quite realistic about this and, you know, I think that's part of why I enjoy doing the job, because I think it's about trying to see what we can do to make institutions becoming more cyber resilient make it as easy as possible for you so in terms of ncc and what we do and what we can do for you and so i'm now going to sort of rattle through some of our sort of key services and products um and i've tried to group them together in a way that's logical but i'm not sure i've succeeded but let's see so first of all, we've got cyber essentials. Um, now I'm quite sure that I'm going to have some comments and questions about this later, so I'll uh, I'll keep this bit fairly brief. But as I suspect you all know, cyber essentials is government-backed program, and any um, business that wants to bid for government contract has to have cyber essentials, as um, basically described as a sort of minimum minimum standard really of basic cyber resilience. Um, my understanding is that Scottish Government has been really excellent and forward leaning in really pushing all institutions to uh, work towards Cyber Essentials Plus. And I think that you will all have Cyber Essentials Plus, but I'm very happy to be corrected on that later. Um, one of the big changes with Cyber Essentials is that uh, from the 1st of April last year, we went to just using one certification body, IASME. Whereas before it was distributed around a few, and I know this has caused a few teething problems, and there's been some perception that some standards have become higher, um, and there's you know I'm happy to address any issues and questions about that later. Something that might be worth you knowing is that uh, at the moment one of the things the Cyber Essentials team is doing, they've actually put together a little readiness tool. So you can go online, answer a few questions uh, before you actually put yourself in for the assessment. And that obviously gives some kind of targeted advice from the information you have input. So hopefully it allows people to be reasonably secure in their submission before they start making it. So that's Cyber Essentials. The other um, issue or something else I was going to mention to you and be interested to know how many of you are aware of, how many of you are aware of CyberAware. Now, this is a campaign about basic cyber resilience, cyber hygiene, and it used to be run actually by the Home Office, or was it Cabinet Office? Anyway, it's now run completely by NCSE, and it's based, um, it's really oriented at the general public, um, and it emphasizes six basic messages, and these might be useful messages to think about sharing with students and staff. The website's actually pretty good, the Cyberware website have got various resources, um, but basic uh, messages that still make a lot of difference to people's cyber security. So there are the six messages. These messages haven't changed. Cyberware was sort of rebranded and relaunched a few months ago, but the basic messages haven't changed. And there's a bit more information about each of those on the website, obviously. I won't read them through. So that's sort of two major things that NCSE does. I suppose one of the other things we do is we use our website a lot to give timely advice and guidance when there are new cyber threats and challenges coming along. So for example, last month there's been something about Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities 
and how they uh, may be used, maybe being exploited by attackers. So we've got particular guidance around those. But um, I mean, just as an example of what we do, really, um, within a month or so of lockdown last year, we produced two pieces of fairly detailed guidance, you know, hopefully, again, practical, um, related to this big shift in homeworking. So about moving from the physical to the digital, so that was advice for people organising networks and the IT infrastructure for organisations. And then we also put out some guidance on video conferencing because, of course, it was only a year ago or so that a lot of us weren't quite sure what Zoom and the like were. Now, I mentioned the video conferencing guide, really, just to sort of make the point that quite often what we do, we, we're often needing to be vendor agnostic. So that's not the video conferencing guide isn't actually saying, oh, these are the pros and cons of each, each package, as you'd expect. We don't do that. But it's much more about the principles and about how you, what sort of checks you need to be doing to make sure you're using these things as securely as possible. And something else I've just put on the bottom of that slide because it didn't really fit anywhere else, to be honest. Um, there's something else we've uh, put up in the last six months or so is some sort of guidance on the principles you might want to think about if you are considering cyber insurance. Cyber insurance is an area that we're getting more and more queries about, and it's quite complex. Um, and as ever, we're never going to say that any organisation should or shouldn't have it. But what we can do is outline some of the principles that we think people might want to consider before making that best choice for themselves or their organisation. So something else we've got that um, I wanted to raise, you may or may not be familiar with. We've got um, an online package uh, for staff cybersecurity awareness training. It's called Top Tips for Staff. Um, and it's about, the whole package takes about 30 minutes to complete and there's a test afterwards. And the reason we've produced this was that we know a lot of small and medium sized organizations and a lot of those in the public sector haven't got the budget or probably the skills to produce their own user awareness training. But we also know how important it is that staff are provided with this. So we've made something available for free on our website. It can be ingested into people's own learning systems um, and it's there for any organization who wishes to make use of it. Now, when I spoke to some Scottish colleagues a while ago, um, somebody pointed out completely rightly that the uh, package actually wasn't really doing very well in terms of accessibility. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons why it's being updated at the moment. Um, so we're expecting a new version of this um, to be launched within the next month or so. So it'll be on our website, but it looks better. It's less clunky. The questions are better um, and the examples are a bit more applied. But you know, hopefully it, that will be something that's useful for everyone because it simply gives entry level awareness about cybersecurity and what every member of staff needs to know. And I thought, what about students there? Because this is something I'm pondering with some colleagues at the moment about whether it is worth or sensible for us to look into providing some kind of training for students, thinking particularly about college and university students that, again, we could make available for institutions to choose to use or not. Um, you know, what sort of thing would students need to be told? How could we do that in a way that it actually worked for them rather than just sort of felt patronizing or just ignored. So I'd be interested in any thoughts on that at the end. And then, um, yeah, just to think to let you know, really, that I mentioned we put out sort of fairly timely advice in terms of things around um, COVID. But we also do a fair, fairly good number of alerts and advisories and, and news items um, through the week, all on our website. So we have a weekly bulletin, um, which some, you know, does a summary of um, cybersecurity stories from across open source reporting. Um, there's our news page there. We can just keep up to date with the latest news stories we're posting around. Um, oh, weekly threat reports. So I've put that down twice. And we've also got a system called CISP, which again, I should be interested to know if people here are aware of and or are using. But CISP is a way for information sharing um, in a sort of fairly secure platform. Um, people can join CISP. They have to be sponsored by somebody else who's already on the platform. 
and it's a way of mainly technical staff sharing sharing intelligence that may be affecting others in their sectors. Um, so JISC runs a group uh, for FE and HE practitioners that has a fair amount of traffic and discussion on it. So that's part of what we do. And then exercise in a box, uh, something that I think is really useful and I suspect we haven't been doing a great job at promoting this, particularly to colleges and universities. Um, so exercise in a box, similar to the top tips for staff training. Again, this is our recognition that many organizations could benefit from some kind of exercising in terms of thinking about their response to cyber incidents, but they won't have the money or the expertise to arrange that exercising themselves. So we've devised a free tool. All you need to do is just register and then you get access to it to enable people to exercise. There's different scenarios set up there. And there's two main kind of tasks within exercise in a box. There's um, simulated exercises that technical teams might want to work their way through. But there's also the tabletop exercises where you'll have a facilitator leading a particular exercise and they'll have the full notes beforehand. They don't need to be any kind of um, technical experts and you might have um, some kind of um, committee management or trustees board members but actually working through some particular exercises um, that are really all based on very very common scenarios we see when it comes to cyber incidents and of course at the end you then get some sort of advice based on the decisions you made um, and so help you reflect on what maybe you could improve or what you might need to look at in further detail so I definitely advise looking at exercise in a box. It's always frustrated me that it's called exercise in a box because there is no box, but there you go. They didn't ask me about the name. And then we have something else, something that's uh, close to my heart because I spend quite a lot of my, although I need to work with colleges, I also spend quite a lot of my working week looking at our toolkit. Um, I'm not gonna say much about this for now, but happy to chat about it if anyone wants to. But um, um, two years ago now, we launched our toolkit for boards. It was originally devised for large corporate boards, but the whole, the principles, the information is, is useful for anyone in any organization, any sector. And this is based on, you know, realizing that many board members, they'll have really quite sophisticated skills in managing risk in issues around finance, for example, and all sorts of things they need to do. But actually, cybersecurity isn't something that you would expect or you should expect board members to have much knowledge of. And, you know, it's been re we were recognizing that it was therefore something that just wasn't being discussed often at a board level. But it needs to be because cybersecurity is absolutely a strategic issue because if you, you know, lose access to your data or your systems, the organization can't work. So it's all about facilitating what the organization does. So anyway, we produce the toolkit for boards, it's on our website. And basically we take nine key cybersecurity issues, talk through why they're important, what board members might want to know about it. And then after each of these modules, we have a series of questions, suggested questions for board members to ask. Um, to really sort of, I suppose the point of questions is to really help start applying some of this information to their own organisation, to get the information they want and to really start those conversations between other board members, but also with their technical experts. So it's really sort of enabling board members to have the conversations they need to have to help get assurance about the cyber security of their organisation and to help drive change. So yeah, that's a, a major project um, we've got and at the moment I'm also trying to do a little bit of work about making this more accessible for college boards because there's a lot of information in this and trying to work out you know how ways of distilling the main messages and really helping people get into it and that's just a screenshot of um, how the talk it looks on our website at the moment but that's about to be relaunched with podcasts and video clips and things um so just something else we've launched in the last year um, that may or may not be of interest to you in your professional and personal life. Um, the suspicious email reporting service, but of course, uh, being civil service, it has to, you know, have its acronym. So SIRS, as it's called to its friends. Um, and we launched this again about a year ago. 
And the idea is it's a fairly memorable, we hope, email address. And we simply ask anyone who's received what they think is a phishing email to forward it to this particular email address. And then there's some kind of alternating, alternate, sorry, automated um, system of actually looking at the domains that these emails are being sent from and trying to work out if there is any nefarious or you know, large scale activity going on that suggests it is in some way related to phishing. And depending on what's discovered and where that domain is based, it might be that the whole thing can be taken down or it might be that we work with the ISP. But really, it's a, just a, a really useful way to be reporting phishing to hopefully do something about reducing it. We've had about a million reports through it already, actually. So it's doing really, really well. Um, but it's sort of quite an interesting project that we've developed. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on really was enough, I think it's part because I wasn't quite sure the different roles that you would come from today. So I'm not sure how relevant this is, but I thought I'd just throw it in anyway. It's just really to ask you and to get you to think about what you do as a college or whether you know what you do about reporting any cyber incident when you have it, you know, whether you are aware of what your policy or procedure is. Um, we was very keen to check whether people have instant management plans or whether their business continuity plan, for example, um, covers cyber incidents. Um, and if it doesn't, to rectify that. Um, but in terms of who to report to, we know this can, sometimes can get quite confusing, actually. So I think it's just worth highlighting, firstly, um, any cyber incidents that's, that's cyber crime or cyber fraud. First of all, please Scotland, the people you want to talk to. In most cases, law enforcement are the people that can help you um, and can help with um, remediation after an incident. I know that JISC very much appreciate being informed of incidents that are ongoing because they can not only often help you as an institution, but also it means they're in a better position to protect the other organisations um, using JISC services. It really helps them. JISC is pretty busy at the moment with those at the moment, as I come to in a minute. It's also great if you want to report to us as NCSE because it helps us build up a picture of what's going on across the country. But we're only resourced to step in and actually help with instance once they reach a certain level of categorization, and that is fairly major. But um, we still always appreciate any, any report, even if it's not something we would actively get involved with ourselves. And I know that Scottish Government also have their, their process for organisations to report to them so they're able to track what's happening. And at the bottom there, I've just got a link to the instant management information we've got on our website in case anyone wants to look that up later. And then just a few, just a couple of things for just a couple of information for more technical staff at your colleges. Um, first of all, we've got the 10 steps to cyber security. This has been around for quite a while, actually, um, and it still largely works. Um, but it's really more detailed guidance on how organisations can protect themselves, different themes, what they should be doing about them. And a colleague of mine has been working on updating this for quite some time because a few parts of it were somewhat dated. It doesn't particularly mention the cloud, for example. Um, and it's that's all being QC'd and we are due to launch it at Cyber UK in May to relaunch it. So 10 steps to cyber security is an excellent framework for people to work from. And then as nicely trailed by Kenji, um, we have tools available through what we call active cyber defense. Um, bit of jargon, really, I'm not, not entirely sure it helps explain what it is, but uh, I just wanted to talk through these three particular products that we've got available for all colleges and universities. Um, and I meant to check which colleges were and weren't using each of them at the moment before we spoke. But basically what we've got is three tools that can do a certain amount of um, cyber security for you almost automatically. They're not available to every organisation. We have to be quite careful about who we roll them out to. So it's generally public sector charities, but we've been doing them, you know, been rolling them out um, quite gradually so we're not overwhelmed. WebCheck, um, the first one, what it does is it scans organisations' websites 
um, and it identifies common vulnerabilities that could lead to the college, for example, um, having some kind of cyber incident uh, where the attackers have got through through some kind of weakness within the website. So it scans the websites for vulnerability vulnerabilities, and then it gives guidance on how to address those vulnerabilities. And this is sort of automated scanning, so it's done quite regularly for you. Um, now, last time I checked, we had 30, about 34 percent of colleges signed up for it across the UK. And I think there were only two Scottish colleges that haven't. So you're doing you're doing very well with that. Um, and then we've got MailCheck. Again, there might be a few questions about this at the end, but MailCheck is a slightly more complex tool to get working with properly, but that's because it's addressing a more complex issue. And that's of um, emails being spoofed. So this is a sort of set of basically helping institutions go through a implement a set of protocols to make their mail servers as secure as possible. And the guy who runs it, our end, um, Tom, really can actually give, you know, one-to-one -one advice on getting various rules and things in place. So getting MailCheck set up can take quite properly, to getting it fully fully set up can actually take a few months, but we do know it's a, a massive issue and it can really help people to prioritise this. So. And then we've got early warning, the early warning system, which I've put in yellow to remind me to let you know that although this is available to you all, um, it is a soft launch. We haven't made it particularly well known that this is available now to all education institutions. So, you know, well, you may not have heard it here first, but we're not in a position to give it a lot of publicity just yet. But early warning is pretty exciting in the sense it, again, scans people's networks and it can send automated alerts if there are signs of network abuse on that. So it can help um, identify some kind of potential attack um, before or some potential threat before you might have otherwise been aware of it. Um, so we hope that's something that will be useful to people. I am nearly done. I'm pretty sure I'm nearly at my uh, 30 minutes as well. Um, so now I'm coming to, yeah, something really very timely. And I mentioned that JISC is particularly busy at the moment. Um, I think to let you know, you, you may well be an be aware at the moment because certainly there's one Scottish college involved with this at the moment that over the last year or so in particular we've had quite a lot of ransomware attacks on um, education institutions. Um, we had quite a major push on the communications about this in sort of September, yes September of last year and actually got quite, quite a lot of national media about it actually um, and at the time we weren't quite sure whether these attacks were being targeted on the sector or whether it was being targeted because that was about the time when many institutions were going back having been closed for a long time um, but there were a whole spate of ransomware attacks on schools on colleges and on universities um, really quite major incidents quite sophisticated um, and we put out advice and guidance at the time um, and things quietened down a little but in the last month or so, there has been another, there's been a real spate of attacks, um, mainly academy trusts. So, you know, schools in England, in larger groups, colleges and universities. Um, and at least a few are not open at the moment. They're not able to be open because the ransomware has taken down their whole system. So these are significant issues. Um, now, I've got here, I say these are hyperlinks. So the, the one in yellow is just to remind me to tell you that this is actually only being published today, the ransomware alert. Now it did go out through JISC on Friday. So some of you may have seen it already, but it's only being made public today and we're getting some um, press around it as well. Um, but obviously what we want to happen is for institutions to know that there seems to be more and more risk for ransomware and to really then look at what they can do to try to mitigate those attacks or you know, then be in a best position to recover quickly. So that's a link to our guidance on mitigating ransomware and malware attacks. Um, that guidance is updated regularly. Um, ransomware is, nature of ransomware is changing quite rapidly. So the advice sometimes changes, just tweaked to keep it really current. And interestingly, one of the things we're seeing is 
that until relatively recently, what happened in many ransomware attacks is that data would be encrypted and organizations would be asked to pay the ransom to get their data back. But we're actually seeing a sort of more and more of an interesting addition to this where the attackers are not just actually encrypting data so people can't access it, but they're also exfiltrating the data and they're sometimes demanding a second ransom to um, not release that data on the dark web, for example. So they're almost sort of getting you twice, really. Um, so that's sort of an increasing concern. And what we're finding generally, not just in the education sector, but generally we are finding that ransomware attacks are becoming much more sophisticated and much more targeted. Um, attackers often spend quite some time within a network um, moving around, trying to get the best highest access they can um, and trying to work out yeah, who to actually launch the attack on. So it's really quite a sophisticated um, type of criminal activity that I think is here to stay. Which brings me nicely to Tiffany. Um, now, I'm not quite sure what stage people usually mention their track, so I just thought I'd shove it in at this point. So when I was asked to, uh, you know, find a find a song for the your playlist, I spent probably a bit too long thinking about it, really. But then, you know, I came across good old Tiffany. I remember her very fondly because I was probably about 16 or 17 when this was in the charts. And I remember her lovely chunky jumpers. And, you know, she was a breath of fresh air. I think I still know, you know, all the words of the song. But... I think the title, I think we're alone now, feels quite apt for, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do, what we're like trying to help you to do is to make sure the only people on your networks are the people that should be there and the people that you know are there and that they're only in the parts that they should be in. So, I mean, maybe not the strongest of links, but it made me smile. So there's good old Tiffany. And so... That's me pretty much. I'll turn the slides off in a minute, but I'm interested really in any questions or feedback you got about which of these products and services you've heard of, what you're using, what's working for you, what's not working for you. Um, I'm interested in thoughts about the usefulness or not of trying to develop some kind of student um, awareness, cybersecurity awareness program. Um, and yeah, so basically, any questions or comments? If I don't know the answers, I will happily take questions away and get back to you. So I shall stop sharing. And you timed that perfectly, Hannah. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I, I imagine that those of you joining us via YouTube will now be shouting at the screen, wanting their questions to be answered. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> you do have to join a live session to do that. So thank you very much, Hannah, um, for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you at a future session um, at some point, well, in the future. Until then, <laughs> stay safe. <laughs>